I touched on this a little bit in the video on how variation can be introduced into a population. But I think it's fairly common knowledge that all of us, where I talk about us, I'm talking about human beings. And uh, frankly, most eukaryotic organisms were the product of sexual reproduction. So if this is the, the first cell that, could, that had the potential to become sal, we know that this first cell, let me say this is the nucleus of that first cell. So I could draw the whole cell and all of that. But let's just focus on the nucleus. That it has 23 chromosomes. Or let me put it this way. It has 46 chromosomes, 23 from my father and 23 from my mother. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 from my father. And then let's say that last one actually helps determine my gender, or it fully determines my gender. That's my Y chromosome. And let's say I had 23 homologous chromosomes, or uh, w one chromosome that kind of was the homologue for each of these, but I have 23 of them from my mother. So one, two, three, four, five. I'll just do. Uh, you get the idea. Yeah, I could just draw a bunch of them, and then have the X chromosome that uh, that was is essentially the the gender one of the gender determining chromosomes from my mother. And we learned before that each of these pairs are ho are homologous chromosomes that they essentially code for the same gene, one from my father and one from my mother. Now. That first cell that had the potential to become me, it was the product of fertilization of an egg from my mother. So an egg from my mother. Let me, so the egg from my mother. The nucleus, well, I'll just draw the whole egg like that. And it had, and let me just do the, I'll just draw, focus on the DNA from now. So my mother's DNA, it had 23 chromosomes. So it didn't have pairs, and this is key. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And then 23 was the, the let's say that's the X chromosome. And so it's, it's a combination of this from my mother. So this is from my mother. And a sperm from my father. So let me do that here. And I'll draw the sperm much larger than it is normally relative to the egg. This is kind of the nucleus of the egg. But let's say that this is a sperm. And it has a tail that helps it swim. And it has, it has 26 chromosomes. Sorry, 23 chromosomes. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And then it has that Y chromosome. And let me do that Y chromosome in a separate color. And just as a side, this unification, this fertilization that occurred from this sperm cell to this egg cell, so it essentially penetrates into this egg cell, and it creates this zygote, which is a fertilized, which is a fertilized egg cell from my mother. And it, this contains all DNA from both my father and my mother. So this very first cell that was created from this fertilized egg, this is called a zygote. And it's a product of fertilization between two gametes. Gametes. So that's a gamete. And this is a gamete. So you can view these, uh, both a, a sperm cell or a egg cell, they're both examples of gametes. Now, the whole reason why I'm doing this is I want to introduce you, well, and I already introduced this notion to you when we talked about um, variation of a population, is that, look, this has my full, my full chromosome complement. It has 23, 23 pairs. And each pair is a pair of homologous chromosomes. They essentially co code for the same things, one from my mother, one from my father. And that is 46, chromos 46 individual chromosomes. 46 chromosomes, 23 for my mother, 23 for my father. These gametes, they each have only 23 chromosomes. 23 chromosomes. Or half the number. Half the number of a full complement, 23 chromosomes. Now, everything that I'm talking about here, the number 46, or 23 pairs, or 23 individual chromosomes, this is unique to human beings. If I talked about other species, they might have uh, 10 chromosomes, or they might have 5 chromosomes. But one thing that is universal for all sexually reproducing organisms is that gametes have half the number of chromosomes as the zygote, or as, or as you can kind of view it as the, the organism itself, the way you know, we, we conventionally think about it. So when people talk about half the number of chromosomes, they say it has a haploid number. And that literally just means half the number of chromosomes. It's very easy to, num in, to, to memorize, because haploid starts with the same two letters as half. Haploid. Haploid number 
for humans is 23 chromosomes. And so you say, oh, if you say this is the haploid number, what do you call it when you have the full complement of chromosomes? Well, that's called the diploid number. Diploid. Diploid number. And I remember that because di often is a prefix associated with uh, having uh, two of something. And so you have uh, twice the number of chromosomes. So this is haploid. This is dip diploid number. And this is for humans. Right for a for an organism that where the diploid number is n, and you'll sometimes see this notation sometimes. So I want to make sure you're comfortable with it. There's some organism, or actually any organism, if the diploid number is 2n, then the haploid number is going to be half of that, or just n. Now in the case of humans, the diploid number is 46. So n is equal to 23. So a fertilized egg, or even a, a, just a, a regular somatic cell or body cell, will have a diploid number of chromosomes, while a, a sex cell, and I'll, I'll be a little bit clearer about that in a second, will have a haploid number of chromosomes. So gametes, which are either a sperm or an egg, those are both examples of gametes. They, either ha they have half the number. They merge, and then you get a zygote, which is that very first cell that has the potential that had the potential to turn into me. That has a diploid number of chromosomes. And I actually want to do a little bit of a side here because it's fascinating. You know, we talk about natural selection, and we even wonder today, you know, to what degree is it occurring? Because our society, it kind of, it's not as as tough of an environment as as the natural world would be, where we're being stalked by predators and we have to live out in the wild and find food and all of that. But even this process of fertilization is an is an incredibly competitive process because this 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 sperm that happened to be the one that kind of won the race to uh, for, from my father to fertilize my mother's egg, it was actually the first of roughly 200 million other sperms. There were 200 million, uh, roughly, I mean, two to 300 million other sperms in that race. So we're all, all already the product from the moment we're born. We're already the product of an intense competition amongst these male, I guess we could call them male gametes, or amongst these sperm cells. You know, some of them might have had weird mutations that didn't, you know, they they didn't know which direction to swim. They happened to go in the wrong direction. Maybe some of them had weird tails that didn't allow them to swim as fast. So you're already on some level selecting for fitness within this environment. So if you had some weird uh, mutations from the get-go in some of these sperm cells, it would have been less likely, especially if they affected their ability to kind of swim, it would have been less likely that they would have been the ones to win this race. So already, you are the product of a race of 280 million organisms, if you consider each of these sperm cells an organism, and you are the product of that winning combination. So you know, sometimes we feel lost on this planet. We're one of six billion people, and all that. We're just a number, but we already are the are are are, are the product of a of a pretty pretty intense accomplishment. But now with this, you know, kind of some of this um, vocabulary. Uh, thrown out of the way. Let's talk a little bit about zygotes and how do zygotes turn into people, and then how do those people uh, essentially produce gametes, which then can fertilize other people's gametes uh, to form more zygotes. So the general idea, so that very first cell that was essentially my mom's egg fertilized by a sperm cell from my father, that was a zygote. And as soon as it successfully fertilized, it has 2n, or it has the diploid number of chromosomes in the case of humans, which I believe I am one of them. I have 46 chromosomes. And then this cell right here begins to split and divide over and over and over again. And we'll do a whole series of videos on the actual mechanics of that. But it splits by a mechanism called mitosis. Mitosis. And mitosis literally is just a cell splitting to form copies of itself. So it just starts splitting into two more cells that are two. And actually, let me do it this way, just because the actual way it works is right when a cell is split, the, 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 the cells that it splits into aren't that much larger than the original one. But now each of these have two n chromosomes, or 46 in the case of humans. And you keep, keep splitting, and it happens over and over and over again. So eventually, so you know, and then these, these keep, well, let me just do it this way. Then this keeps splitting. And then you have, and I'll go into the, the words for some of these initial collections of cells, but I won't go into that right now. 
2n, all of these are original copies from a genetic point of view of that original cell. And then eventually, they start to really, you know, start to have tons of them. There's, a, there's just a gazillion of them that starts to, that, you know, just they're all duplicates of this cell. And they all contain the 2n number of chromosomes, the diploid number of chromosomes. They all contain that all of my genetic material, but based on how they relate to each other and what they see around them, they start differentiating. So maybe, and so all of these have 2n numbers, so they're all diploid. And the mitosis is, this is the process the whole time as these divide uh, one cell into two cells and those two cells into four cells and keep going. And then these begin to differentiate. Maybe these cells eventually differentiate into things that'll turn into my brain. Uh, these cells right here to differentiate into things that'll turn into my heart. These cells here differentiate into things that will turn into my uh, lungs, and so forth and so on. And eventually, you get a, in the case, in, uh, you get a human being. But it doesn't have to be a human being. It could be whatever species we happen to be talking about. So let me draw the human being. So I'll draw just an, uh, let me see, my best shot at an outline of a human being. So eventually, and you know, the, now we're talking about gazillions of cells. You have your human being. And I'll just draw a very simple diagram, outline of a human being. Let's see. When I was in high school, I was a class artist, so I don't want to make this representative of my true artistic ability. I'm doing this here just to kind of give you an idea. But anyway, eventually you keep dividing these cells, and you end up with a human being. This human being, you know, these cells, the cell, you wouldn't even notice the cells on this scale. Now, most of these cells of this human being, if this is me or you, these are all the products of mitosis that started off with that zygote, and it just kept dividing and dividing and dividing into into mitosis. And but it differentiated into, you know, I said some of them will turn into brain cells, some of them will turn into heart cells, and we, that the whole process of differentiation is actually fascinating. And we'll talk a lot more about that when we talk about stem cells. But uh, and embryonic stem cells, and maybe we'll even talk about the, the debate a bit. But s the, the question is, well, how do I then produce those gametes? How do I produce those things that eventually, if I'm going to reproduce, uh, turn into uh, uh, these kind of haploid number of cells? And that's what happens in your, in your sexual organs. So in a male, you have some germ cells. So some of these cells turn into germ cells. And the germ cells exist part of your your reproductive organs. So let's say those are germ cells. In a male, they would be part of the gonads. So they would be there. And in a, in a female, they would be involved in the ovaries. And these germ cells, they're the product of mitosis. So let me draw a germ cell. So a germ cell is the product of mitosis. So it still has 2n, 2n. Uh, number of chromosomes, so it still is a diploid. It is still is a diploid cell or has a diploid number. But what's special about a germ cell is it has a potential one. It could either do mitosis. It could either continue to do mitosis and produce more germ cells that are identical to it. So it could produce two germ cells that are identical to it, or it can undergo meiosis. 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 And meiosis is essentially what a germ cell undergoes to produce gametes. And so if this germ cell undergoes meiosis, and I'll do a whole video on the mechanics of it, it'll actually produce, instead of two cells, it'll actually produce four cells that each have half the number of, of chromosomes in them. So these cells are haploid. haploid. In the case of a male, these would be sperm cells. This would be sperm. In the case of a female, in the ov these would be ova, sperm or ova. And these are the gametes. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing to talk about. Because in the last several videos, I talked a lot about mutations and what does that do to a species. But think about what happens. If I have a mutation in some cell here, some somatic cell, some body cell, somatic cell, somatic cell. Will that mutation, or can that mutation, in any way affect what's going to happen to my kids? Will that mutation be carried on to my kids? Well, no, 
Because in no way will what goes on in this cell affect what I actually pass on eventually in, in the sperm cells. It'll just be a random mutation. It could affect my ability to reproduce. For example, it, it could be, um, you know, God forbid, it could be some type of, uh, of, of cancer or something that, especially if you, if you contract it at a young age, it, 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 it might be some type of terminal form. So that might affect your ability to reproduce, but it will not affect what you pass, the actual DNA that you pass on to your, to your offspring. So this could, if you have some really bad mutation here it could affect how you live or it could affect it could it could turn cancerous and start reproducing but it will not affect what you pass on to your to your children the things that the the traits that will be passed on or the changes that will be passed on are those that occur in the germ cells so if you have mutations in your germ cells or during the process of meiosis you have uh, essentially recombination of dna because of crossovers and we saw that in the variation video then that will introduce new forms or new variants inside that could be passed on to your children and i really want to make that point clear because we talk about mutations but there's different types of mutations there's some mutations that won't be passed on to your children and those are the ones that occur in your somatic cells. Maybe some of them do nothing, so then it really doesn't affect your overall function. But then the mutations that either occur in your germ cells or occur uh, or, or or the the recombination or the variation that is introduced during meiosis that will be passed on to your children. But even there, I want to be careful because remember, this is a severe competition. So out of all of the, let's say there's 280 million sperm cells that at one time are being competitive for an egg. It's possible that some of them have mutations. Some of them have mutations. In order for the, one of those mutations, let me do the mutations in different colors. That's a purple mutation. That's a blue mutation. But in order for that mutation to truly be passed on to my offspring, the, one, the, the, the sperm containing the mutation is the one that has to win the race. So already you have a selection going on at kind of this, uh, at, at kind of this sexual reproduction level, where you're selecting for things that are at least good enough. I mean, the, the, to some degree, the sperm has to be good enough to, to win this incredibly, incredibly co competitive race. So if that mutation somehow made the sperm deformed or didn't allow it to swim or made it behave in some weird way, it's very unlikely that that mutation would go on to be the one, or, or that, that cell would go on to be the one that would successfully fertilize an egg. So anyway, I wanted to introduce you to these ideas. Uh, the main ideas is really some of the vocabulary, haploid, diploid, it's very confusing when you first learn it, but it literally just means half the, the, the normal contingency of the normal uh, uh, group of chromosomes, and in the case of humans, that would be 23, and the, the cells that, are hap that have a haploid number of chromosomes are our gametes, which are sperm cells for men and ova or egg cells for women. But everything else in our body, all of our somatic cells, are diploid, which means they have the full complement of chromosome. They all have a copy of our DNA. And that's why DNA testing is so interesting, because you can get any cell from someone anywhere, and you have their full complement of DNA. You have all of the information that describes them genetically. Anyway, see you in the next video.